one of the five units where I have a section eight tenant and they were my first tenant and I really like them. Section eight has a lot of cool stuff, especially in a larger city because they will determine the price of a bedroom purely just based on zip code and bedroom count. Uh, it's really nothing else. So a four bed, two bath and a four bed, one bath will have the same value for it. So there's some opportunity there. If you have a less nice unit, that's maybe a couple hundred square feet lower, not as nicely updated as somewhere else, but they'll take the average of all the four bedrooms in the area to determine your price. Welcome to the House Hacking Success Podcast, where you'll learn the path to free rent and financial freedom through real estate. Featuring your hosts, Brad Labrie and Drew Klingler. What's up, everybody? Let's take a quick minute and talk about Rent Ready. Are you new to house hacking and wondering how you find tenants and collect rent, especially while trying to maintain professional boundaries and a shared living space? Rent Ready can help you manage your house hack setup. For less than $9 a month, you can do it all. Fill rooms quickly with sites like Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist with a free professionally designed listing page. Find high quality tenants with TransUnion certified background checks, electronically send, signed, and store leases, and collect rent for the entire lease or set up month to month charges. For your tenants, they use Rent Ready's app to complete the application, sign their lease, and pay you rent. They can even submit maintenance requests from the app instead of knocking on your door. Even better, Rent Ready is unlimited, so you don't have to pay per unit or per tenant. Just one flat price, which puts more money in your pocket. And speaking of putting more money in your pocket, Rent Ready has given our listeners a discount to get 50% off any Rent Ready plan when you sign up using our special code SUCCESS at RentReady.com. That's R-E-N-T-R-E-D-I.com using code SUCCESS for 50% off any Rent Ready plan. All right, let's get back to the episode. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining. Real quick before we start the show, I just wanted to let you know that we have a free download available in the description of the show notes. It is the guide to house hacking called the House Hacking Blueprint. If you want to learn how house hacking works, go download that guide and you can start learning right away. Welcome to the House Hacking Success Podcast. Today we have Avery Heilbron on the show. He's going to talk about a couple of house hacks he did. He's going to have some great DIY tips. And I think this is going to be a really good episode. Really looking forward to it. How are you doing today, Avery? I'm doing well. And I'm really excited to talk about house hacking. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Why don't we start out just talking a little bit about your background? You know, talk about what kind of events led up to you discovering the house hacking idea and how that started too. I'm originally from Vancouver, Canada, and I made my way out to the States, specifically the Northeast from playing college soccer. And once school was done, I just happened to go to the bookstore one day and I always had an interest in business books and finance books. And I just picked one up called Retire on Real Estate. And this was maybe a month or two after I graduated. And that book specifically just talked a little bit about real estate, but it also mentioned bigger pockets. And so kind of a lot of stuff spurred from that. And I got, figured out bigger pockets, found some of those books and looked at Brandon Turner's Low Money Down book, which mentioned house hacking. And I was from then on pretty much set on what I wanted to do and just tried to get right after it and get that first property as fast as I could. Awesome. And then when did you get your first house hack? So that first one was March, 2019. Okay. And that wasn't too long after you graduated from college. Is that correct? Yeah. I graduated in May, 2018. So it was like eight months or whatever that is. Did you learn about house hacking while you were still a college student? The only the first time I learned about it was after reading that book, which was like, like two or three months after graduating. Okay, cool. What advice? Do you have any advice for anyone who just graduated looking to buy their first home? Did you experience any like challenges of being so young looking for the first property? The first biggest thing was I had no credit. I didn't really know anything about that. So I had to wait for six months of just having a credit card before being able to get pre-approved because you can't get pre-approved without a credit score. So if you're in school or just getting out of school, like getting that Discover It card is great. You don't need any prior credit to get approved and paying it on time and in full so you can have best chance of the best interest rates are 
it's probably my biggest thing that made things take a while and maybe lost out on some properties, but also happy that I did because the one I ended up with was really solid. Yeah. So was getting opening up a credit card and just putting all your expenses on there and paying it off on time? Was it that simple or was there any other tricks that you had to do to get that credit score up? So just in terms of credit scores, like the utilization, I would put very minimal spend on it because the less of it you use, the better score you're going to get. And then also lenders like to see a couple of different accounts. So after I opened that first one, after maybe a month or so, I opened up two more just to have a variety of accounts. I think they like to see like six total and kind of a mix of different loans and stuff. So if you had student loans or other things like that, then, and you're paying them off, obviously you got to pay them off if you want a good score, (laughs) then that really helps. Okay. Awesome. That's a cool strategy. You know, if you don't have credit, get a credit card, keep the balances low and pay them off on time and should be good to go. And what loan did you use? How did you finance that first house hack? So the first one, I pretty traditional did the FHA house hack three and a half percent down, like most people talk about. Um, and the property was 525 and I got a $7,000 closing credit. So I didn't have to pay that out of pocket. So it was like an $18,000 down payment. Awesome. And a lot of people might not realize too, the FHA, they're pretty low on the credit score requirement too. So if someone doesn't have a credit score or does have, or, you know, doesn't have a very established credit score or low credit score, that FHA, the minimum is 580 for the credit score, but then the lender can add on to that. So it really depends on where we're at in the market cycle. But a lot of times uh, you can have, you know, around 600, 650, be able to get an FHA, no problem. Yeah. And you can get good rates too, even with that, with those scores. So, but even with my strategy with the only having credit for six months, I think just paying it on time for those six months and not really using it that much. I opened it up when I first got one at like 710. So if you already don't have credit or you're starting out at scratch, it's not too difficult to get a decent score. Did you notice like after a couple months of owning that first property, did you notice increase on your credit score? Because like for me, I didn't have the greatest credit ever when I bought my first property. And in the first like three or four months, it went up like 80 to 100 points. Like it just jumped right up. Oh, really? I don't think that happened to mine. It was like I said, around 700, 710 and kind of leveled off around 750 after a few months. So I guess that's, I mean, that's a pretty good jump, but yeah. not hundred points. Oh yeah. And I was sub 700 too. So that there was a lot of room to jump up. So that first property, uh, what kind of property was it? Was it a single family, multifamily property? So it was a multifamily duplex. Uh, it was an up down. So the upstairs was a four bed, one bath and downstairs was a two bed, one bath where I ended up living. Okay, cool. And then When you rented that, what was the experience like when you were listing the property, trying to find tenants? Did you have a tough time finding tenants or was it pretty easy for you? So because it was a four bedroom, a majority of the people interested were uh, families with young children. So under the age of six, which had the implication of lead paint laws coming into play. And you can't rent out legally to someone, at least in Massachusetts, which is a pretty tenant friendly and strict laws. So I couldn't rent it out to those people, which was about 90% of the applicants. So like two weeks into listing it, I got the place lead safe compliant. And then I was able to to get a tenant pretty quick after that. And then also in the Boston market, it was pretty typical of the tenant paying a broker fee. So I actually had the guy who helped me purchase the property, who was my buyer's agent, do the listing of the property. But since then, I've done my own screening of tenants and getting them in. Okay, awesome. So you moved on and you ended up getting a second house hack after that first one. How did you end up financing that second one? And what was it like? What did you have to do to get the down payment for the second one? And how long did it take you? Yeah. So I guess just going back to the first one, I was able to get 3,600 in rent roll and my mortgage was 3,300. So I was doing pretty well in terms of not having to pay rent and getting a couple hundred bucks over the mortgage, which obviously sped up a lot of the savings. So for that one year, I had a bunch of savings and I also refinanced to get out of the FHA loan at that first property. And when you refinance, you have a month off of paying the mortgage. So all of that rent that I got basically was added savings as well, which was like six, $7,000 a month because they also send you the escrow check. So it was a pretty cool month just from <laughs> that specifically. And so just because I wasn't paying any mortgage anymore or any rent, I was able to save really, really fast. And then I got rid of that FHA loan and other FHA loan on the second property. That was about a, it was $24,000 down payment. So also like a decent price. I, it ended up being 678 was the, the cost of that one. And, and like the first one, I also got the closing costs 
paid by the seller or wrapped into the loan. So I didn't have to pay those either, which saves a lot of money. Okay. And I believe that's called selling sessions, right? That sounds right. So when you refinance into that conventional, you know, typically you got to have that 20% equity. Where did that equity come from? Was it renovations that you did or was it just pure appreciation of the property? I walked into that first property. It was pretty disgusting, like smelled quite horrible, full of mouse poop. And I don't think anyone had really done any work to it since the 1980s. It was all quality work at that time, but it just had gone through some hands of people that a couple of things that were like Mickey Mouse fixes. There were some hangers holding up gas lines, things like that. But I did a lot of the cosmetic work myself. There were some, I had to do an electrical upgrade, which I'm not going to do that myself and some other things like that. But most of it came from the forced appreciation. And actually with a duplex, a lot of lenders will treat it more like a single family. Uh, so I only needed the 15% in order to get the conventional okay. loan. In that case, it's like, you know, you went through, you renovated a large piece of that property. Did you have any prior experience with renovations or is that something that you just decided you were going to learn how to do on the spot? Yeah, I had nothing. I think the most handy thing I had done before was tape a poster to my dorm room wall. So I just kind of tried to figure it out as I went. And YouTube was a big help for that. There's a ton of great YouTube information out there for DIY, especially. And also very helpful because a lot of the guys who are contractors and professionals will go watch those videos. I think to entertain themselves and comment on how bad some people are. So usually you can figure out which videos are the correct ones based on the comments and knowing the right way to do stuff. So that was really helpful. And to be honest, if I had the funds to pay someone to do the work, I would have loved to do that, but that really wasn't in the card. So I had to do a lot of it myself, but now I enjoy doing some of those things. I definitely don't want to, if I purchased you know, more properties down the line, go do it myself. I'd want to pay contractors, but on my own personal residence, it's just like a fun hobby on the weekend kind of thing to do. Yeah, of course. I think a lot of people are going to be in that same kind of position that listen to the show. You know, they might find a property that they found a great deal on it and it was a really low down payment, but they might have to do a lot of renovations. And I think the strategy of the DIY makes a lot of sense, especially with the cosmetic stuff. You know, like you said, electrical, you're going to want to go get a contractor if you're not familiar with electrical. I mean, the amount of time that it would take you to learn it in the first place and the amount of time that someone could come in who's a professional and fix it, you're going to see a balance on that anyways. But yeah, I mean, the DIY stuff, if you're not going into a move-in ready property, it's really important to learn, I think, for a lot of people and develops a skill set too. So if you learn how to fix something, I mean, you're going to be able to be a better property manager and you're going to have to rely less on contractors or handymen if you're self-managing the properties. Yeah, I also think it's really helpful for, you know, I've worked with contractors before and whatnot, and you're able to know if they're actually doing things correctly, if you understand how it works. Like if you're in a bathroom renovation and they throw drywall around the surround and tile on that, like you're going to know that's wrong and you're paying for someone doing something incorrectly. So at least you can keep people in check as well and understand the costs of how much things are because you know how much the materials are and can figure out the labor and all that. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think uh, that applies to a lot of aspects of just life in general. I mean, I always make the argument that you should should self-manage your properties before getting a property manager. One, so you can just understand the processes of being a landlord and you can familiarize yourself with that. But if you understand the processes of being a landlord, if you understand what makes a good landlord, what makes a bad landlord, you're going to be able to pick a property manager based on your experience and you're going to be able to find the best one for your properties. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, having that own knowledge and practicing self-managing, I think is really important. And with the house hacking, it's pretty easy, especially because you live right there. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like a uh, real estate investing on training wheels. Exactly. Yeah. Let's talk about the lead paint. I'm kind of curious about that. So you had lead paint in the house and it was something that you legally had to take care of. So only if there was people who were attempting to rent that had children that were under the age of six, because then the child can get lead poisoning. And a lot of states have very different laws. So Massachusetts, as I mentioned, is heavily favored on the tenant. But for example, in New Hampshire, if you had a tenant who got lead poisoning, you have like 180 days to remediate the lead. Like you don't have to do anything prior. But in Massachusetts, it's a big deal. So if I found someone who was under the age of six to rent, you know, with the kids, then it would have been fine. But also along those same lines, I really wanted a section eight tenant and you have to have it deleaded. So lead paint remediation for them. So it, that helped a lot with that. And that's another big reason why I wanted to get rid of it. And along that too, the person who did the lead paint abatement for my property, you know, I'm just kind of a curious person. So I asked him a bunch of questions and I ended up 
doing lead paint abatement as a side hustle for like a year there. Just okay. working for that guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys, we got to be honest here. Rent Ready is a property management software that is truly working to elevate the entire renting experience for landlords and tenants. But this isn't just a boring old podcast ad about how you can manage all your units, maintenance, screening, leases, tenants, and rent using Rent Ready's mobile app. No, this podcast ad is a secret because this month, Rent Ready is releasing a game changing feature that will save you a whole lot of time and headache when it comes to crunching numbers on your rentals. Well, we can't share it just yet. Make sure you stay tuned to the House Hacking Success podcast for that surprise reveal. Because we have it on good authority that Rent Ready will be letting our listeners know once the top secret feature is ready. In the meantime, if you're looking to get started using Rent Ready's powerhouse of a platform, get signed up and save 50% off any Rent Ready plan using our special code SUCCESS. That's 50% off any Rent Ready plan when you sign up using our code SUCCESS at rentready.com. Go to R E N T R E D I. Dot com. Use code SUCCESS for 50% off any rent ready plan. Let's get back to the show. Do you, do you have any advice for anybody if they, you know, ran into that same situation? How would they get rid of the lead? And well, I think that so- I think most places, most states, uh, it's not really, an, it's kind of a non issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, just looking up in your state's laws around it is probably important. And, you know, with like fair housing laws, because I can't legally tell someone who's under the age of six, I'm not renting to you because there's lead like technically. So it's important to just realize that stuff. But I think probably like 45 of the 50 states most likely don't care that much about lead. Uh, And I think you just have to give them like, here's a disclosure that there may or may not be lead in the house. If you get sick, this is on you basically get rid of the liability but in massachusetts it's a big deal but at least at the end of the year the state does give you a 1500 dollars tax credit per unit that you de-lead and so it cost me 1100 dollars to remediate the lead paint in my apartment but then at the end of the year i got 1100 dollars from the state so it was kind of free okay cool so what's that process look like do you have to just sand down all the walls get rid of all the paint it's only in a couple spots so like Technically, lead paint compliant doesn't mean there's no lead paint. It just means there's no lead paint where it'd be accessible by like the mouth of a child, like sucking on a door jam or the windowsill. And then, you know, like windows opening and closing and doors opening and closing will create some dust. So you really just have to get those places. So if there's lead paint on the wall, that technically doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And yeah, Michigan is one of those states where you just... You give them a disclosure, they sign on it saying that they received the disclosure, that they read and review it, and then you're kind of good from there. So that second property, what kind of property was the second property? So the second one was three family and it was a bit non-traditional. So Boston is littered with those classic triple deckers, you know, stacked one on on top of the other. But this one was two stories. So the first floor was cut in half. And a studio was at the front, a one bedroom at the back where I lived in the one bedroom. And then the upstairs was a two bed. And for that one, I actually inherited both of the tenants, but they were playing or paying pretty close to market rent. And that one was actually very interesting because I purchased it in May of 2020, which was kind of like right at the height of everyone being inside of the pandemic, which actually was a really good opportunity because there weren't that many buyers. So I just knew being an FHA buyer, not being the most desirable for a seller that if I wanted to buy a house, I should, this would be a good time. Awesome. And do you still have those tenants today? One of them moved out. That was actually a really interesting tenant. They're probably the only annoying tenant I've ever had. They weren't that bad, but it was a boyfriend and a girlfriend. And then the girlfriend's dad were living there. And then the boyfriend and girlfriend broke up three months into their lease and they were trying to figure out a way to get out. And, you know, I was, I was being very reasonable. I said, these are my options. You can either pay two months rent and get out of your lease completely. You can find someone else who I can screen and is suitable, but they really weren't having it. So then ended up being the boyfriend and then the girlfriend's dad stayed there while the girlfriend moved out. So imagine living with your (laughs) ex-girlfriend's father was the situation. And so once they moved out, that was fine. And I have a new tenant up there and he actually is paying an extra 200 bucks. And then the other kid who was in the studio 
super nice guy. I only increased his rent like $50 when he renewed his lease. So that's good. And then the apartment I lived in, it's a young professional couple and they're paying a a pretty good price. So now it's pretty well stabilized. Okay, cool. So since you bought those properties, you know, we were talking about before the show, you mentioned that I moved a little bit of ways away from that area, but you're still self-managing. I'm kind of curious about that. How does that work? Like what strategies are you using to be able to self-manage those properties from a long distance? Yeah. So for those listening, I'm currently living in North Carolina and my properties, two of them at least are in Boston and I do self-manage. And even when I bought the second property, which was only a mile from the first one, I was trying to practice as if I was living as far away as possible. So I tried never to go there or do anything and just make sure I had the systems in place for when I knew that I would most likely be moving. Because even if I was living 30 minutes away, I wouldn't really want to go there all that often. But pretty simply, I just have good contractors, handymen, and I've fixed up both places quite a bit before I moved out to lower a lot of maintenance issues. But I just have some lock boxes outside and keep them in discrete places. And then I have a buddy who will change those codes every once in a while if if too many people have come by. Awesome. And then as far as like, if you're going to show the property for a potential tenant, uh, what kind of strategy would you use for that? When I rented them out recently, I did it myself because I was living there, but and kind of during the pandemic in Boston, the whole idea of a tenant paying a broker fee was not happening so much, but recently it, it's kind of back. So I would just have a real estate agent do it because it sucks for the person renting an apartment, but it is kind of the standard that you pay a broker fee. So it's free for me to have the agent rent out the apartment and then the the tenant pays the cost. So, Okay, cool. Cool. And what about stuff like snow removal, lawn care? Uh, How do you take care of those? So there's no lawns on both properties. And then in my leases, I just say that the tenants are responsible for their area. So the second property has a driveway on the left and kind of like a little garage driveway on the right. And so the person who parks in those specific spots has to clean it up. And if there's any common areas, they figure it out. Same thing for the first property. There's a tandem parking spot and I just say they figure it out and they're cool with it. So yeah, that's easy enough. Same situation down here. You know, you just clean up your area and we're good for me. I cut the lawns because everything's local, but eventually going to outsource. So you mentioned that these were section eight. Are you doing section eight for all of your rentals right now? or just some units? It was just the one unit that I have as section eight right now. I really wanted to do the two bedroom that I recently rented out at the three family as section eight. Uh, But in that process, I learned at least in the Boston area for the housing authorities that the unit has to be vacant for a full month because the housing authority has to go in and do their inspection while it's vacant. So you couldn't have someone move out on the 31st and the tenant moving on the first. And I was able to find market tenants where that was the case and I didn't have any vacancy. So I figured that was good, but it's only one of the five units where I have a section eight tenant and they were my first tenant and I really like them. Section eight has a lot of cool stuff, especially in a larger city because they will determine the price of a bedroom purely just based on zip code and bedroom count. Uh, It's really nothing else. So a four bed, two bath and a four bed, one bath will have the same value for it. So there's some opportunity there. If you have a less nice unit, that's maybe a couple hundred square feet lower, not as nicely updated as somewhere else, but they'll take the average of all the four bedrooms in the area to determine your price. So even when I moved out, I was originally getting 2,400 from that section eight tenant. And I asked for an increase to 2,600 and then they gave me 2,880. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even ask for it. So (laughs) no kidding. Cool. So they must've did an analysis and figured out that they should be paying you more. That simple. (laughs) So is that something like, if you're interested in doing section eight, can you approach them, figure out what you would make before moving forward with the process? Yeah. So at least in Boston and each housing authority will have their own specific rents that they do, but Boston housing authority has a whole list of basically every single zip code. I think in mainly Eastern Massachusetts, so in and around Boston, and how much they'll pay if you rented by room, one bed, two bed, three bed, four bed, I think even all the way up to a six bedroom. And they even determine if 
the tenant is paying electrical and gas, you should take off X amount of dollars from the totals. You could run your numbers very like down to the dollar if you really wanted pretty specifically with that. Okay, cool. And then how do you approach looking for section eight tenants? Is it, is it something that you simply just advertise and then you kind of go through the section eight process, uh, once you find a tenant or is it something where you initiate the section eight process first, and then you start finding the tenants? So you can't technically just say this is a section eight rental, at least in where I was, it might be the case elsewhere. And like I said, it's kind of specific to your locality and the housing authority. But mm -hmm. basically the best way to advertise for a section eight tenant is in the description, you say vouchers are accepted. And then the second thing you do is that you price the rental at the top price at which they're willing to pay, because that's typically how much of a voucher the person will have. So those are really the, the two things. And then it kind of stems from there that majority of the people you will get will most likely be section eight trying to rent the place. Okay. And then after you accept them, is there anything that you have to do on your side as far as process or paperwork? So there were two things that I had to do. I had my own lease, but they also have their own lease, which you have to sign uh, as well as you had to get an inspection. I actually had to get two inspections. One was done by the city and then one was done by the housing authority. And they were the exact same inspection, but that was the case. And my tenants have been in for two years now and they had to do another inspection recently, but it's pretty bare bones, the inspection. They just make sure that the appliances are working, the, the heat is working, that there's adequate amount of outlets and that they're paying for a place that is livable, not some janky house or something. Cool. So, so you got a couple house hacks, you know, they're, they're out in the Boston area, you're managing them long distance, they're cash flowing for you. And since moving to North Carolina, has there been anything else that you've been up to? Did you go into another house hack? What'd you do? Did you buy a property or are you renting? So I really wanted to buy another small multi, do the same thing. I wouldn't have been able to use the FHA, but that would have been fine for the down payment. But there's very limited multifamily stock in this area. So I ended up just going for a single family live and flip. And I was thinking maybe more about a house hack, like a bigger house, but there was just a really good opportunity with the one that I'm currently sitting in with the fact that it was a really ugly house, gross house in a super nice neighborhood, like one of the more desirable neighborhoods. It's like the, the doctors that work at, you know, the Duke University, stuff like that. So I just figured there was a lot of opportunity to do some DIY work, the bathrooms, kitchen and stuff like that, and then sell it for a decent little profit. So that's kind of what I'm going about. Plus the cost of the mortgage isn't anything too high, especially because the cost of living down here is a little bit lower than in Boston, but that's pretty much the strategy that I went for this particular one, but I'm looking to do some, some other stuff, hopefully soon. Awesome. So how is the live and flip going? It's going well. I've painted the outside of the house, did the kitchen over, you know, painted, did a backsplash, renovating, like ripped apart one of the bathrooms. It's getting close to being done. And then I'm going to do the other bathroom. And I think I also have to sand the floors, but we'll see if that happens. <laughs> Was there any kind of like strategy going in? Like, all right, I need to get this room done. So I have somewhere where I can sleep comfortably and then I'll just do the rest of the house or, you know, like, what was that like? Did you have to pick out a certain spot? Yeah. So there's a little bit of that because when I did the house hacks, I had about four weeks or so before I moved into both. And I just went every single day and like every hour of the weekend and renovated and and had a deadline for myself. So it was, I had to get done, but here I'm living here. And so I'm kind of just doing one room at a time and having a second bathroom is the best because, you know, you don't really have to worry about the other one getting finished because before I have done a bathroom renovation where it was my only bathroom, but at least back then I could go to the office and shower. Uh, and then there was a local brewery with the bathroom you could use. So like, those are the, <laughs> there you go. those were the couple of things, but I'm going a bit slower about it which is nice. And, you know, it's two years minimum that I'm going to be living here. So there's no real rush to do it all. And rather than spending every waking hour of the weekend and after work doing it, I work on a couple of other things. Yeah. It takes a lot of the pressure off. Oh yeah. Big time. So you intend to flip that? You intend to sell it or do you plan to rent that out? Hard to say right now. Uh, I think it would make a really good Airbnb just because it's like a very good location, pretty mm -hmm. close to the school right downtown and we're making it look pretty nice. And it also could be a great opportunity to not have to move all my furniture again, because that sucks. 
Right. Awesome. So do you got any tips for our listeners just about networking? You know, how can they become better networkers? So I think networking was the biggest catalyst to me even getting my first property. It's been a little bit more difficult to do in the last year and a half. And the agent that I first used, who was really awesome, I met at a networking event and he was great because I said, I don't think I'm ready yet to purchase a home. And he said, that's fine. We can go to properties and I'll just teach you everything you need to know. Taught me like what to look out for, what were some warning signs and things like that. So obviously that was instrumental in in buying my first property was doing the networking. And then I actually started my own meetup at one point that was going pretty well, but then stopped because of the pandemic. But the title of that one was Network to Grow Your Net Worth. And it's super cheesy, but it's definitely true. So I think even if you're just struggling, figuring out what you want to do next, just talking to someone else about it, like clearing the air, maybe getting more ideas is is valuable, whether you find a partnership or you're just trying to know how to do something like it's, it's just valuable to talk to people about it. Yeah, absolutely. And do you have any tips on partnerships? So I did actually at one point, I somewhat entered a partnership. It wasn't official or anything like that, but we actually had a 23 unit building under contract in the New Hampshire area. And I think I got a little bit of the shiny object syndrome, just hearing the idea of buying a bigger property. And these people were also interested in that. And I think I rushed into that partnership as well as that deal. Ended up backing out of the deal because they egregiously lied about the amount of rent they were getting. And then they weren't willing to renegotiate when we figured out they were lying, but I at least got all my money back. But I think it's important for you hop into a partnership to just like actually be friends with someone and know them pretty well. So I'm a little bit more cautious come that stuff now, especially just because of my experience with the first quote unquote partnership I had. But I mean, I'm really glad I had that experience. So I feel better about it now. And there's maybe one or two people that I'd feel cool about getting a million dollar loan with, because that's also something to think about. If I ended up getting that 23 unit building, I would have been sharing, I think it was like $2 million loan with these people, which is no small amount of money to, to think about. Yeah, absolutely. You want to find people that are strong in character and, you know, have similar beliefs that you do and, you know, people that are going to be able to work together. One of the things that, you know, with the podcast that makes like, it's so good with me and Brad, my co-host, he couldn't be here today, but we have very opposite skill sets too. And I think that applies not only on with, you know, running a podcast and Instagram account, but I think that really applies to um, investing in real estate as well. You want to find a partner who's like-minded with a skill set that you don't have. So you can kind of pick each other up. Yeah. Especially when you don't like doing something, if they like doing it, that's fantastic. Oh yeah. That's the greatest thing ever. All right, cool. So you got a YouTube channel. Uh, you got about 7,000 followers. Mostly, you talk mostly about finance. Do you got any advice? Because, you know, there's probably a lot of agents listening to the show, other people who might want to just talk more about real estate online. How can they build an online presence? Yeah. So, I, so first of all, yeah, it's mostly about finance. And I do talk about real estate investing stuff. And I'm also trying to build up Instagram, maybe be like yours. But I think an important part of doing the online presence and creating a brand, social media, all that stuff is just hammering away at it. Most of your content that you put out is probably going to be pure trash, especially when you're starting, which I felt like is still the case for me. And I've been doing it for like nine months. So I think just continuing to do it and then talking about what you're interested in. Sometimes I've attempted to make videos that I think would be a big hit or something like that because some other big creator is doing it and they end up doing poorly. But And you can also burn out if you're not just talking about what you want to talk about or what you find interesting. And then the other thing is just actually adding value to your audience. So not just trying to promote the next link that you have, that if someone signs up, they get, you know, you get 20 bucks or whatever, but actually giving value to the people around you is really important. But I've had some friends who tried YouTube at the beginning of this year, you know, they did 10 videos or something like that, and they didn't have a thousand subscribers within 10 videos. So they gave up. It's really just a time and numbers game and continuing to go at it. Because like I said, your content is probably not going to be very good at first, but you will get better at it just like with anything. So, And it really does have compound interest too. You know, the more you create, the more viewers you're going to get and the more viewers you're going to get, the more you're going to align with the algorithm and then Mm -hmm. the more viewers you're going to get. So it kind of just builds off itself. And so, especially like I noticed with Instagram, once we hit a certain point, the organic traffic way up compared to like when we first started. Right. Uh, And I'm sure the same thing for YouTube. And you, it's a finance channel you have. Do you have any finance advice that you'd like to throw out there? Well, I think 
at least for me. So the first couple of years of this journey of like financial freedom, I I've really tried hard to, to save. And I guess sacrifice is the word to the general public. To me, it doesn't really feel like a sacrifice, I guess, but now I'm trying really hard to focus on increasing my income because you look at a place like Boston. So when I was starting out, I had a $65,000 salary, which I was able to get a $525,000 property, but that's also quite limiting for someone who's right out of school. If they're only making 50,000 and they're told they can't get a property, but if you can focus on increasing your income, maybe instead of trying to get a partnership or get 5% stake in a property, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I think increasing your income will just make your life way easier in terms of attempting to get more property. Yeah. And I always see this argument online too, of like, you know, you shouldn't have to like house hack and save money and be frugal because you could just increase your income. And I think they're both equally important. I think um, saving money, house hacking, being super frugal to save up for a down payment in the early phase is extremely important to get things rolling, but in parallel, you can also learn how to increase your income. So, um, you know, eventually all the things that you cut back on, even after a year, if it takes you a year to save up for a down payment to get a house hack, after that year, once you get in a house hack, because you're saving a ridiculous amount of money because you're not paying rent, you can bring back those things like eating out or going on trips or whatever. You can bring those back into your life. It's a short-term sacrifice. And then, you know, you can keep learning how to make more money. You can learn new skills while you're doing it. So saving money can be very passive if you house hack, but learning how to increase your income and make more money is very crucial as well. Yeah. And then, you know, we say that and it does take a while too. Cause like I even said with the YouTube, someone makes 10 videos, they feel like they want to give up. Like you can't just increase your income overnight and you can't just get a house hack overnight. You're gonna have to do like small incremental things day to day to get yourself there. So it, it definitely takes some time. Yeah, absolutely. So we're getting near the end of the uh, show, but before we go, got a couple of closing questions for you. Do you have a favorite business or real estate book that you would recommend? So my favorite one that definitely when I read it, I was like, yes, I'm as much of a hardo as this guy was uh, Scott Trench's Set for Life. So I think that one was is really good. Kind of just a good blueprint for anybody. And, and I like how it talked about kind of making that median salary or maybe it's slightly above median, but and how you can become financially free. So it's it was a great book. Yeah, absolutely. Scott Trench is awesome too. We had him on the show. It was a really cool episode. So what would you say is the difference between people who actually house hack and those who are not really taking action on it? Yeah, I think if you are someone who is house hacking versus someone who's not taking action is, I guess this goes back to, I think we were talking about this before the show with YouTube. Sometimes people value more just seeing someone else doing something that looks cool. Like people want to see people driving in a Lamborghini, but they don't want to learn how to build a business to be able to drive a Lamborghini. So I think that if you're actually taking focused steps to get things done and you see the vision of it, then you're going to want to take action and see the value in it. Because the people who are house hacking just see how much sense it makes. It really does just make a lot of sense to do it versus the other people see like, oh, this is cool. I could live for free and get a rental property, but I'd rather have a fenced in yard and a dog kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I will say it's a lot easier to do if you're used to already living with roommates. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> it'd be a lot harder to go, you know, living in that single family and revert to house hacking. I know a lot of people have done it though, and you know, they're way better off because of it. So where can people find out more about you? Good chance to plug that YouTube channel. We'll put it in the description as well. Yeah. So all of my socials, I think YouTube, it's just Avery Heilbron. So my name and then my Instagram, and I've been trying to hammer away at TikTok. They're underscore Avery Halibron. Actually, my buddy has been crushing the TikTok. I'll give him a shout out. John's Finance Tips. He's gotten like 150,000 followers in the awesome. last like nine days. So <laughs> that's amazing. That's real impressive. Yeah. TikTok's a great place for organic growth. Cool. So oh, yeah. we'll put all the links to that into the description. So if people want to go check out your YouTube, your Instagram, or your TikTok, all that stuff, they'll be able to find that. I really appreciate you coming on the show, Avery. I think you have an awesome story and can't wait to hear what you get up to in the future. Yeah, me too. And, and thanks for having me, Drew. Awesome. Thank you.